Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <coughs> Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum and good morning. Salam sejahtera. Selamat pagi. Uh, today we will start the lecture on autosis engineering and I will cover this is for the EME 422 biomechanics and the lecture is on autosis 1 which is introduction to autosis engineering. I'll take about seven lectures in this part. Um, so my name is Zaidi and we are given two days and three hours to cover all our parts. The first lecture starts on Tuesday and the second lecture is on Friday, two hours for it. So the coverage is the first one is the application of engineering mechanics to orthosis design. In particular, we will look at uh, Rex, uh, which is in a Wilmington uh, exoskeleton. And then we look at knee osteoarthritis, KOA. And then finally, we look at medical uh, device act. So as an introduction, um, we just want to start with exoskeleton because it is the closest to mechanical engineering. And it's becoming more popular as the available technology is made more accessible. And the research in exoskeleton progresses uh, advances in particular in the area of robotics. Uh, it will be quite a challenge to cover the whole robotic exoskeleton at this level, but what we will do is to study some of the early and basic exoskeleton, uh, which are relatively simple and of low cost. Uh, the analysis will also allow us to look at the approach in providing the biomechanical solution to the problem and also the clinical study uh, that has been carried out to measure the efficacy of the product and at the end the adaption level of the product. It is also good when we are studying this topic to pay particular attention to why the patients rejected or refused to adopt solution because this can be a very important reason to understand uh, why some products are successful and why some products are not successful or not being adopted by the patients. Uh, this is without, if we don't understand this, we might uh, repeat the same mistake uh, made by many uh, designers or engineers when they were trying to find or design an orthotics for the patient. So let's look at the early form of uh, uh, exoskeleton. Uh, this exoskeleton is a exoskeleton is from the Greek word exo, which is outer, and skeletos or skeleton. Uh, it is the external skeleton that supports and protects an animal's body in contrast to the internal skeleton, which is called the endoskeleton, or for example, a human. Uh, so by using this definition, perhaps the oldest form of exoskeleton would be the walking cane and from there, the crutches. This image was an example of a person who lost a limb, a leg, half one of the leg and supported by crutches. So this can be said because it's external to the body, it can be said as an exoskeleton. And more recently, in the modern world, we have exoskeleton that matches the profile of a human being and allow to allow us to transfer some of the loads away from the skeleton so as not to injure the person and allow the person to carry more weight and more payload, for example. So this is an exoskeleton. We start with this so that we understand uh, a little bit and how we progress over the years in terms of our design of uh, orthosis and prosthesis. So look at the early form of design of the crutch, okay, uh, which was a T-shaped uh, walking stick. So we have a, a T-shaped walking stick. So this is the T part, and then uh, from uh, crutches, and then it de developed into a V-shape. So this is the T-shape and then it becomes a V-shape. So this is a V-shape. And crutches were made from large piece of hardwood, which was cut accordingly and split near to the top into this V-shape. So 
this is the V shape that they are talking about. And the wooden underarm section will be attached top. This is the underarm section. Okay. So that's the wooden underarm. And uh, to the top and middle for both underarm. And then, and then that you put here as a handle. So this is the handle. So these are very popular as they allow for the use of the hands while supporting the injured person weight underarm. And user could lift heavy loads and perform everyday tasks. So this sounds like uh, why is this important? Because meaning that even when the person is injured, the pet is injured or he's without a limb, they can still carry out certain works. And human need to work in order to feel they are worth something and make sense of or can give a sense of purpose to their life. So later a plush model was designed for those with money and uh, made comfortable with sling top uh, from a leather pouch filled with robust fiber. So they start to cover this part, the top part, with cushion. Okay, And the load on the two contact points between crutch and body has been in development for many, many years. So this is, has been around for many, many years. So we start with that kind of understanding. So from historical point of view, the crutch was first patented in a modern world for commercial production by this guy, Emily Schlick, in 1970. So then you have got these crutches here, some pictures, big crutches, small crutches. Crutch mills pop out in the hills of New England where they were produced. This is in America. Amazingly, some of these mills are still open uh, and they use the same production method that were used during the Civil War. And there are two diff different types of crutches which have evolved differently in their own right since this time. The basic T-shape, as we showed, uh, seen before, and the common V-shape crutches. So it's been around for more than a hundred years. So what is the difference between orthosis and prosthesis? An orthosis is an externally applied device used to modify the structural and functional characteristics of the neuromuscular escalator system. And the word orthotics is a medical specialty that focuses on the design and application of orthosis. A prosthesis, on the other hand, or prosthetic implant, is an artificial device that replaces a missing body part, which may be lost through trauma, disease, or condition present at birth. Prosthesis are intended to restore the normal functions of the missing body. So if you have a leg, for example, like if you have a person with a missing limb so if you put an implant so this can be the prosthesis okay so that is a prosthesis because it replaces a missing body part orthosis is applied device to modify the structural and functional characteristics of the neuro or skeletal system so for example like you you have a knee person with a knee and they put something a brace on so this is externally applied device yeah so this is an orthosis externally applied device makes the stabilize the knee for example so that's an orthosis and this is a prosthesis In the case of robotic or powered ex exoskeleton, actuators are attached to the skeleton to move the exoskeleton or to assist in the movement of the exoskeleton. Uh, with the addition of actuators, more movement can be introduced to the patient and this is then improved by including the control system so that a more natural motion can be achieved. This is a long uh, process to get into this level of achievement in, of the technology. In particular, motion initiated from the signals of the muscle, for example, electromyograph or EMG, can be used to drive the actuators. Rather than relying on a fixed movement trajectory with the human feedback in the loop, a better human initiated motion can be achieved. So we are looking at this and the ability to read the signals of the muscle of the EMG in order to drive the actuators. 
simple statements, but it takes years to, in, to make it into a reality. So that is the uh, powered exoskeleton. So and the progress of uh, exoskeleton has been from external structure, which bears no resemblance of the human limb. These were in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, to the X structure that resembles the actual human limb. Okay, this is the more modern uh, exoskeleton uh, because of the that women want to be seen as normal as possible. So you can see that they can apply a bit more human-like, and then later on you can put more artificial skin and so on to make it more human-like. So there is this word cosmesis. Uh, to cosmesis, yeah, to change to more like skin like. Okay, so we uh, so these are the developments from here to now. Okay, in the future it might be a softer, a soft robot uh, that is more uh, comfortable for human being. So let's look at the prosthesis in more detail. Uh, I take this article from uh, Daily Mail in UK because I think we can learn a little bit of the development of prosthesis into the history of things. So, 150 years ago, a shoemaker named James Gilligan Gilligan met a man who, after losing his arm in a cannon accident, was told by doctors there was nothing that could be done about it. Offering to make the man at arm and arm at no cost. Remember, James Gilligan is a shoemaker. Okay, so he's a, I'm gonna I'm gonna underline this shoemaker because I'll come back to this. So with that uh, offering to make the arm uh, and arm at no cost for free out of humanity, I guess Gilligan, based in Chart, England, was eager to put his craftsmanship to test and subsequently invented the first ever artificial limb. So this is also, he's a craftsman, a shoemaker. He is a shoemaker, craftsmanship, initially make shoes into making artificial arm. So there's a series of remarkable black and white images Photographed by Gillingham itself show just how detailed each perfectly fitted each prosthetic was. And this was described as strong, light and durable in an 1866 article in the Lancet where the artificial limbs were made out of leather. So, according to the Chart Museum, the shoemaker would mold the leather to the patient's limb before hardening it. Yeah. And by 1910, Gillingham had restored mobility and function to over 15,000 patients. Nicknamed the leather leg here. The prosthesis took 10 days to make and was said to be easy wearing and not likely to get out of repair. Simple in construction and as beautiful as life in appearance as documented in the Lancet. You look at it and you can see that how it resembles a human leg as close as possible. So that brings, uh, restore the feeling of uh, how a person with a proper leg is. So Gillingham said the patient must be on the spot to have the limb properly fitted and adapted to his individual case. Okay, so this word properly fitted and adapted. He said that all cases are not alike. Some stumps are too short, stumps are this part of the legs, yeah. So when they cut off these legs due to injury or birth or whatever, so some stumps are too short, others too long, muscles shrunk to the bone open ends, bed flaps, stiff joints, disease in the stump, and many other difficulties known only to the practical limb fitter which renders, which make 
any fixed rule in making a leg or arm impossible. Fixed rule means that you have a uniform solution to everyone. This is not possible. So it has to be properly fitted and adapted because everybody is unique and different. So this is an example of the leather leg. I took all this from the from the internet. Yeah. So uh, it took about ten days to make. Remember, it has to be softer and harder and, and all these uh, final details carried out. It's easy wearing. Uh, and as I said, not get of repair, simple in construction and as beautiful as life in appearance. You must resemble the actual leg. The patient must be there in order to have the limb properly fitted and adapted to his individual case. Remember shown uh, in this diagram. So you got the leather leg as an example. And whenever we learn something, uh, this is how we should think in terms of the perfect outcome of the perfect product that we intend to produce from our study or from our design. So James Gilligan, who died in 1934, wrote, There was nothing remarkable in his make, only the principle of fit and adjustment. But he admits he soon became popular, and as the claims on my time in this direction increased, I gave up my original business, his original business was, to make shoes, and threw my whole energy into this new sphere of usefulness. He became, he found that this is very helpful to others, and very useful to many. So he uh, concentrated his work on creating artificial limbs from leather. So the leather leg was born. So these are several pictures of people with uh, artificial legs and this artificial hand and some of the hands as an end effector which you can put a knife on and you can uh, do some work with it. And these are example of a hook and some form of attachment, a clam or something that you can hold a letter on. So these are to make yourself or to make the person available for employment and bring uh, sustainable or they can carry it, uh, earn a living from from simple works you yeah. know so this is his uh, contribution to humanity so <clears throat> that is the principle of fit adjustment where the individuality of the problem all cases are not light some stumps are too short others too long muscles shrunk to the bone, open ends, bad flaps, stiff joints, disease in the stomach and many other difficulties known only to practical limb fitter which renders any fixed rule in making a leg or arm impossible. So remember this whenever we design an orthosis. It must be able to fit and adjust it to the individual problems or conditions. So lessons. First, the prosthesis must be easy wearing and not likely to get out of repair, simple in construction and as beautiful as life in appearance. And secondly, the principles of fit and adjustment. It is always a challenge to cloak the functionality with aesthetics. I said this, it's quite easy to say it on words, but it's very difficult when we try to implement it practically. As both are necessary, in order to be not only accepted as a medical device, but more than that is to be appreciated. Later on, when you look at clinical study, you will understand how there are a lot of solutions that has been abandoned by patients because they don't just uh, like the feel of it or they don't feel comfortable with it or it becomes, it is, doesn't fit their idea of a normal person or they don't like to be seen in it and so on. So this is uh, a, a separate challenge from the typical engineering challenge we can be around trying to overcome stress or thermal problems or dimensions problems yeah so this to me is an important part of um, um, biomechanical engineering so let's move on to the current trend uh, this is hybrid assistant limb uh, which is available in our USM hospital in Kubang Krian uh, for person which has a uh, problem with walking due to accidents and so on under the Perkeso uh, clinic at the hospital uh, USM. This is 
uh, a piece of robotics uh, with co a separate controller with controllers and actuators and with feedbacks from the uh, EMG and so on. It's a very complicated piece of machine and it is not cheap. So accessibility by patient is also an issue here. So there is a robot suit, uh, a Japanese uh, robot maker, Cyberdyne, uh, which is uh, the, the one that we showed before, has received a global safety certificate uh, for a bionic suit, uh, paving the way for its worldwide uh, rollout. Yeah? So let's look at some of the work that uh, Cyberdyne has created. So, they have multiple wearer strength by a factor of 2 to 10. So, you can increase the strength of the wearer uh, um, significantly, which is very useful in areas where manual labor, manual labor is where, for example, in palm oil harvesting or in lifting weights or in, in, the so in, in soldier carrying heavy guns and heavy ammunition and so on. Sensors detect nerve signals on skin surface to anticipate movement of the wearer. So whenever we move, the muscles will receive signals from the brain and from there the muscle will contract or expand in order to uh, move the limb. So that, that signal is being used to anticipate movement in order to synchronize the motion of the muscle and the motion of the actuator. So joints work in coordination with natural muscle movement. So in here, they, I guess they put the motors at the joints so that they will add to the uh, movement or the, to the torque of force created by the individual muscle. So you got the power units here, a motor here, uh, maybe a geared motor for the upper limbs and that you got the power units for the lower limbs and then there is a floor reaction force sensor and then there is a control unit on the back and there's a battery pack so here is a robot suit and you can see that the hand is supported by the limb so that the the bone is not overstressed and there's enough strength covered by the robot suit and that you don't uh, fracture the bone because you're overweight. So what is the potential use? It can use as a support in medicine. Uh, so you can use for rehabilitation and physical training. You can use it for to support for the disabled and you can support for manual work especially and disaster relief and also for entertainment okay and this tank weight 23 kg and as the lower body is 15 kg and the battery is enough for it to have a continuous operating time of two hours and 40 minutes so let's look at how this voluntary control functions okay so cybermic voluntary control first in initiating walking brain sends impulse to the muscles so the brain sends signal to the muscle and bioelectrical signals appear on the skin surface so there is there are sensors that is attached near the skin and the sensors will pick up on the signals and then and then send the impulses to the processor so there are sensors here here bioelectrical sensors at the limbs and then it will pick up the signal and sends it send the signal back to the processors so the processors then calculate the amount of power needed and this has got to be done with some form of mapping the signals to the power required by the muscles okay uh, so the this calculation must be done within the uh, impulse time or the time of the census so that the power unit calculate the amount of power needed 
and therefore it can send the right current or voltage to the motor to create the kind of motion or torque that they want for each joint. And Cyberdyne claims that the process responds a fracture of a second quicker than muscles. Uh, we know that muscles are not that fast in comparison uh, with computer processing. So uh, this is possibly to be true. Um, but the data coming out from Cyberdyne is not, uh, there's not a lot of clinical work has been done for us to, and repeatable because of the cost of the structure is relatively high. It costs about, I think, almost half a million a unit or something like that. So what is the future trend? Uh, we have a future trend of a brain computer interface, uh, e.g. for example, uh, the Neuralink by Elon Musk, where a device is implanted and connected to the brain. And from there, uh, the brain can read the signal from the computer elsewhere, transmitted wirelessly with antenna and so on. And there is an interchange of data from the brain to the computer. So it's called brain computer interface. It, this is the interface. This is the brain. You don't see the computer. It's a clock computing, whatever. The computer can be anywhere. But there's a wireless connection to the computer. And there is an interchange of data from the brain to the computer. And how do you read the data directly to the brain without going through the eye is something that uh, I'm not able to understand yet. Okay, But this is how uh, creative and the ingenuity of a human being trying to whether there is a damage to the brain, uh, results of clinical trial, whether we get what is the side effect of having interference with the brain function. Can you sleep with it? it will, does it uh, affect your emotion? Is there overload? How do you know it's overload and so on? Is it reversible if I take it out and so on? So these are what happened to the brain when it's so dependent on certain orthosis, for example, like does it shrink? Does it grow? You know, for example, muscles, if you support the muscles too much, the muscle will shrink and uh, eventually die. And bones will get weaker when it's supported. So it needs, it needs to be stressed out. It needs to work out also. Whether this increases the working out of the brain or reduces the working out of the brain. We'll have to wait and see. So how does we as mechanical engineers can help uh, create new advanced orthosis? Uh, there's a lot of development in mechanical engineering uh, and that can help us create new uh, orthosis. You have seen uh, how historically from Gillingham to the uh, robot suite by uh, Teledyne and how this can help. And this is still, uh, is, is still quite big and expensive. So you look at how we can use uh, control system to do powered orthosis with smaller motors, more powerful motors. Nowadays, a car, electric car is available. So you see very powerful motors in electric cars. And you can put a big powerful motors, small powerful motors at the joints and to become powered orthosis. We also need to look at how we can process signal from brains to computer signals. We need to understand this better. Uh, look at the neural link by uh, Elon Musk company uh, to do control and instrumentation and try to interface with the brain. So this is an attractive uh, area of research, but it's also not clear how they are going to monetize or how you're going to create economy or money from this kind of uh, uh, effort on brain computer interface. The other part is the additive manufacturing. Uh, with additive manufacturing, you can create a lot of funny shapes, which means that you can do the principle of uh, fit and uh, adjust, which can make you can make components made to fit the required uh, part of the human body. So you can fit uh, a solution according to the uh, requirement of each patient. So additive manufacturing uh, is one area that we can uh, use to create more acceptable 
more uh, solutions that is no longer uh, fixed or constant, but it is made to fit individualized solution, so to say. The other part of engineering, which is uh, very important to me, I think, is the fact that miniaturization, our ability to create smaller and smaller components uh, so that we can have uh, powerful components but are small enough to fit under the garment. So most of the time, the orthosis people would like to hide it and one of the uh, requirement or uh, before we can hide it is to make it small enough to fit under the garment or something that can be hidden or not to be so obvious okay so it should be wearable because it is small it should not be it should be light and also it should not be too obvious and then there is also this cosmesis of devices it should look uh, like the natural hand or natural skin and you can hide it and people would like to see that this is uh, not like a robot arm. So the challenge is still there, out there in the market to come up with this um, artificial hand or orthosis that looks and feel and move like a human hand. So uh, this is an, an exciting area of research uh, which breakthrough could lead to a significant commercialization impact. Another area that is also important is the human tribology. Uh, whatever we do, we need to interface um, the orthosis to the body. So when there is an interface to the body, uh, the skin is the uh, interface to between the human and the orthosis. So the skin is there to have several functions. First, uh, it needs to do heat management. And skin managing heat by uh, producing sweat so the evaporation of the sweat is the primary cooling uh, mechanism of the skin so when you put something over the skin and you uh, carry out work using the orthosis heat is being generated at the skin so when when heat is generated sweat is uh, being produced and there is no room for to evaporate the sweat and it will make the skin weaker and maybe create some boils or, or swelling and this can uh, hurt the patient and becomes uh, very uncomfortable so the human tribology part is how to make uh, the interface becoming cooler uh, not to be too highly stressed and to manage the skin to be intact without creating puncture or wound uh, or injury to the skin. The second last part is the cost. Uh, in order to make our solution accessible to the population, we have to make it affordable. So in order to make it affordable, we must have, we need to design something which can be easily manufactured easily repaired, easily assembled, easily uh, boxed or easily packaged, easily sold and easily implemented or used. So these are several series of design challenges that can make it uh, quite difficult for us uh, and at the same time we need to make it profitable too because without profit nobody would or no company would like uh, or we'd, we'd be able to uh, provide the kind of services that is needed. So there is a balance between cost and profit, but the key thing is to make it affordable and at the same time profitable. It is a balancing act between affordability and profitability. And engineering tools are being used to achieve both functions. And finally, the issue is about beautiful and philosophical. So when you design an orthosis, it has to be beautiful and also there is some meaning to it there is a philosophy behind it so try to go for acceptance and adoption of your solution uh, most of the time we will find that people reject the, um, the solution uh, because of some reasons and our job and task as an engineer ethically is to go and find 
the reasons and find solutions so that our solution is acceptable and being adopted by people and this can be achieved by making the system or the autosis beautiful and as some reason for somehow it's appeal to the emotion via some philosophical tools or some philosophical meaning so with that i think i would like to conclude the first lecture uh, in the second lecture we will go into the detail but i hope you have learned something from uh, this lecture why we study this and some of the challenges and the hopes that we could go for a more uh, clear and functional autosis um, by studying uh, biomechanical biomechanics okay so thank you very much assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh